what you just heard are Diabolical Invincible Me and Solid State Invincible, aka the background music for Omniman vs Homelander and Omniman vs Bardock respectively. If they both happen to sound familiar, it's because they're both inspired by the song Tom Tom by Holy Fuck, aka what plays during Omniman's infamous massacre of the Flexen planet all the way back in season 1. <laughs> The lyrics, as I'm sure you notice, reflect two very different sides of Nolan, aka his arrogant, detached and cool self on season 1 and his humble, remorseful and semi-redeemed self on season 2. As soon as Solid State Invincible dropped, I knew I couldn't wait to get into the themes and lyrics, how it's a perfect musical sequel to Diabolical Convince on Me, how it perfectly fits both Nolan and Bardock's nature as war machines in search of atonement, then this happened. Yeah, we will address the Hail Mary in the room and its reactions later on in this video, but until then, hello, I'm Oka Krypton, and welcome to my very first Dead Battle Season 2024 review, Oni Man vs Bardock, aka My Space Dead can and will beat your Space Dead. Remember to like, comment and subscribe. Now let's begin. Right off the bat, the editing is nothing short of visual eye candy. It's quick, fun and easy to follow along even if maybe a bit too fast paced at times. Like, let us enjoy this introductory slice for more than a second, you know? However, this quick pace grinds to a halt during a very neat moment where Wiz's voice slows down and echoes as the camera pans out to sell just how far intergalactic distances go. Great sound design. The main references are there, I mean, I would have been weirded out if they weren't, but they sure made me go, oh, and of course, they got the memes. What made me out like chuckle, however, is when they turn a drag style wise Gamora joke into a reaction of utter disbelief about Nolan's, uh, meeting practices. The music for both characters is also really nice, be the techno slash electric sounding music for Nolan, conveying that modern sci-fi feel, or the old school sci-fi epic trumpets for Bardock's breakdown really channeling that martial arts movie vibe and oddly reminding me of something you did when you reached Bowser's castle in a Mario game, of all things. Final Rob boss vibe is what I'm trying to say. It also gets almost operatic, maybe a bit Star Wars-y once you get to Bardock's more humanizing side, which is also great. Going from the presentation into what was actually said in these breakdowns, I was totally sure they were gonna mention how Nolan's story ends in the comic, since it adds another parallel to Bardock's, but I really went for the animated Invisible Fans friendly approach, which is perfectly fine, but it is funny to think of the contrast between this and dropping Mani Makima's true nature as the control devil before even the first slideshow pops up. I guess they're holding back on info for when Nolan returns to fight Rose Quartz, which let's be honest, it is his last good remaining matchup. On Bardock's side of things, lesser bridge jokes than expected, more so digs towards ocean up weird supermanisms, which was perfectly fine and warranted, even if probably a wee bit head scratching for those who don't know. But between some more great editing and really unexpected references, I really liked how they thematically tied Bardock's journey to unlock Super Saiyan to Goku's. And it won't be the first father son parallel either. Speaking of parallels, it's really nice how they focus that both Nolan and Bardock's newfound empathy and rebellion for the empires stands from how the love for their families made them spare and even protect beings that they would normally kill and conquer without a second thought on a normal day. On multiple rewatches though, the way this somewhat overhype Bardock's fighting habits did kinda come across as trying to compensate for his relative lack of material, or trying to apologize in advance so far the fight will end, but that's for later, that's for later. I did notice the lack of wits and boobstick animated bits, and this may be a hot take, but I honestly didn't mind them at all. In fact, I think they would have kinda slowed down the pacing in this episode. I think I've heard on the Dead Barrel cast that it was only for this episode, which is nice since it means it'll always have this old school Dead Battle feel. Also, big W for recommending to check out the Invisible comic. Do support this industry however you can, please. Right off the bat, I love the musical sting the fight starts with. Really sets a sci-fi mood, reminding me of Freeza 1 2. As Bardock lands on Traxa, which is very accurately rendered in 3D by the amazing Devil Artemis, Chef Kiss. If you don't have the episode in mind, however, Bardock's comment about it being a bug planet probably hints at the Traxans he saw running away off screen. And speaking of background stuff, you can hear the city alarm popping off basically as soon as Bardock lands.
Great idea to have most of the fight take place in a purple sky setting by the way, as it fits right at home both with Dragon Ball visuals and Invisible 2 visuals. Some things are just meant to connect, you know? Unlike... <laughs> Nolan wastes no time to try to end the invader on the spot, bringing us to the revelation of where he stands in this fight. This planet isn't anyone's to conquer. I love, love, love this line. It would have been so easy to just quote the original one, but, we, but by replacing yours with anyone's, it still keeps the double meaning, but we invents it. So instead of secretly meaning, nope, this planet is actually mine, it now means this planet isn't mine, Viltrum's or anyone else's to conquer. Obviously confirming that this is post-redemption Northern, aka the evil in the situation, fighting off against a very much still planet conquering Bardock. And also true to this version of Nolan, just because his morals have got better, that doesn't translate into his black air force energy growing any softer, as we'll get into soon enough. Don't underestimate me! Bardock defies Nolan's words as he charges up with a primal scream, and I gotta say, both voice actors do such a great job, man. Bardock is voiced by Cameron Nickhead, same voice actor as Black Adam, meaning that he's not really, he doesn't seem to be too lucky on either side of the Congo spectrum, but still gets a Saiyan warrior energy to a T, with his raw attitude, great screams, passionate declarations, that just mesh with Nolan's no-nonsense calm approach so well. I love how his swearing is for fun moments, whereas Omni-Man's single swear serves as a declaration of self-disdain. Just like my son, sticking his nose in places he's not ready to as far as making these two warriors organically talk about their sons, aka the major team of this fight, goes, I'd say they put it off pretty well. Nolan compares Bardock's brash nature to Mark's, and Bardock replies with, My son would kick his ass! Which also counts as an unironic, but he can't beat Goku though, and, that, and the fact that he managed to pull that off is nothing short of brilliant. Granted, it's probably more out of a but Saiyans are better type of thingy, but still, from the same perspective, I still think it's pretty sweet. I think. Tom Sharks reprises his role as Omni-Man from the previous fight with Homelander. And while I think he does an amazing job in both episodes, I just think there's a bit more versatility in this one. More of a range, you know? There's still that quiet and straightforward arrogance that defines the character, but since he's fighting an actual warrior instead of a man-child, you hear him go all out as well, especially at the end, where he sounds almost exactly like J.K. Simmons. Your time is up! Saiyan! Why did you make me do this? You're fighting so you can watch everyone around you die! He even gets a Mortal Kombat 1 quote that I immediately recognize for some reason. Am I supposed to be impressed? Am I supposed to be impressed? That's an actual quote from Only Man. He said that at some point. Maybe Mortal Kombat. Guess I watched too many of those intros. <laughs> also, as Arborist gently pointed out, this clash references both Mortal Kombat 1 and the Dragon Ball Fighter Z game, meaning it's a twice as awesome reference. In general, what I love about Nolan as a combatant, as something that I think was captured very well in both death battles, is his straightforward and efficient fighting style. Sure, as far as evil Superman go, he lacks the iconic laser beams. I even made a meme about it on my Instagram. Follow me on my Instagram. <coughs> and both of his opponents trap him in versatility. But it doesn't matter how many flashy weapons and powers you got if your opponent can forcefully make you look down your own back. Keyword if. We are getting there. Let me talk about the stuff I want to talk about some more first, please. Nolan just feels like the more skilled and militaristic of the two, compared to Bardock's more savage approach. It's just pure brawl, precision and brutality. God, I'm sounding like Alfred. Look at his speed, his ferocity. <laughs> Despite being his with himself, this battle doesn't shy away from nods to his former nature, even subtle ones. Obviously, there's, there's the starting punch from the back, which mirrors what he almost did to Immortal, but the way he throws Bardock's own ship against him, forcing him to grab it as a distraction since, you know, he, can't, he kinda needs it, also works as a much less gruesome callback to when he threw Darkwing's corpse at Green Spectre. Also, you know, it's the usage of the environment. And I'll always love having that in my death battles. Really helps sell the continuity and immersion. The way he looks down on Bardock and calls him an embarrassment also brings major you should have died at birth energy from his alternate universe self. Which brings us to the Great Ape slash Ozaru section of the fight. My only problems with the animation from a technical standpoint is honestly small stuff. 
like Baldock C2 Neck in this scene, the wieldy slow pacing in these two scenes, and the way Nolan's model at times kinda look, looks like a living wax statue of Only Man, whereas Baldock looks like he's a full rendered self, really, which really goes to show just how much passion Devil Artemis has for the Dragon Ball side of things. Including the entirety of the Great Ape fight, honestly, in which Devil Artemis shows huge improvement on the size difference side of things, going from shy and away from it in the last Dragon Ball fight to outright, em to outright embracing it in full here, all while giving me even more hype for Hulk vs Godzilla. Normally slower moving giants convey the scale better, but the exact opposite works, works wonders here. I love how fast and strong the Ozaru transformation feels. Not only that's true for hostile apes in general, but since Ozaru is meant to be a power boost, I'm glad they show precisely that. After an old school Vegeta callback, Nolan spins him around and whips his tail, prompting his confusion at the fact that it came off before even a complete spin, which is an oddly cute moment for him. He literally goes, what? Like he's Mario, come on. <laughs> Nolan then proceeds to whip Bardock with his own tail, which now that I say out loud definitely sounds racially motivated, as the fight takes us to space, and the main event of this episode slash video. All the wild music fully kicks in and uh, you know what, yeah, let's talk about that next. As I said in the intro, Solid State Invincible, named after Solid State Scouter, aka Bardock's team and, uh, you know, works as a great musical sequel to Diabolical Invincible Me. A title that, while quite a mouthful, references both the evil things Nolan and Nomi have done and how unstoppable they are in their respective shows. The The Speak of Me reference also points, you know, some kind of self pride about your own wickedness, almost in a ooh I'm so bad type of way. I'm not saying Diabolical Invincible Me glorifies the evil acts per se, but there's definitely some Homelander energy sprinkle in there, ironic given how it's a song about how effortless it is for Nolan to embarrass, stomp and kill him. The song however also references just how insignificant most people are to Nolan at this point of his journey, even expressing pleasure at the idea of spreading pure pain and suffering in their faces. It conveys his sheer destructive power or infamous is for it and how everything basically belongs to him. The song feels menacing and scary all the way through, but the very last pass shifts gears to convey the intense, suspenseful and haunting terror most of Nolan's opponents feel in his presence, in this case Homelander. Solid State Invincible starts with a familiar yet distinctly different tune. It's not weaklings anymore, it's normal people. They don't look the same anymore, they feel the same. This is not a sociopathic boast, this is someone discovering empathy for other beings. The idea that they feel the same emotions as you do, and they aren't just animals or insects. We get another mention of, of their faces, but not in pain, it's the very idea of them even looking at the narrator's general direction, something you can't even bear to witness. The echoed words aren't even pain anymore, it's shame, like your own conscience was talking down to you. The inner voice proceeds to do a militaristic mantra in an attempt to keep those emotions in check. To make the victims feel the same again, all in the name of quote, the Empire. But it's not enough, as self doubt spreads once again about whether your newfound heroics can truly atone for your past sins. The give up, give up in this part specifically doesn't even sound like it's talking to the opponent anymore, but to yourself. To me, it all sounds as if it's to say, give up on trying to be a better person. You will never atone. You are not supposed to be this way. You're not supposed to feel this way. Even when it returns to boasting, the voice doesn't even sound confident anymore. It's not a, you already know who I am, who doesn't. It's a, now that we met, you feel the threat, right? You're scared, right? But it shifts to feel like an inner struggle again, as the voice now essentially tells you that the only way for you to truly pay back for your actions is to end it all. I mean, after all, what else can you do? It's your fault. You did this. Bardock's team then starts playing, almost as if your default settings are kicking in. The last part however, instead of sounding haunting, haunting and terrifying, it sounds epic and heroic. The whole song was on a higher tempo than I borrowed Convincible Me, but this part just makes my soul go super saiyan every time, I swear man. However, despite the very uplifting turn, it all abruptly ends as a familiarly foreboding note takes center stage again, and we feel the eerie sound of what to me almost sounds like the brakes of a train stopping. Nolan, what have you done? You know you did lose self-control. 
Now, Diabolical and Miswami is obviously as straightforward as a matchup and outcome is associated with, but Solid State Invincible just overflows with the sheer thematics between Bardock and Nolan, the self-doubt, the conflict between protecting their loved ones and the militaristic mission of, of spreading conquest in the name of their respective empires, the more heroic feel overall compared to Nolan's previous state of self and opponent. To me, this track does to me lyrically what Dustin Moon did to me musically, it's just <coughs> chef kiss, 11 out of 10, I swear. This is not the first instance of, instance of Dead Bell tracks mimicking previous ones. Fun fact, you will hear the same tune in every Brandon Yates Dead Bell track that has a Uchi in it. But this is the first time it was done to serve a story, a multi-season character arc both for Invincible and Dead Battle as a whole, and to me, that's great. Now let's get into what you clicked for. First things first, this shot right here. The very idea of taking the climax in front of a blue star is just cinema with a capital C. Bardock says he can't let Nolan win, declaring his sons need him. And that alone gives him enough energy to turn Super Saiyan, calling back, or well, I guess calling forward, to Goku's I will not let you destroy my world! I won't let you take me from my world! Also, the phrasing here implies that his sons are his world to him, which is, ah, oh, very sweet. Super Saiyan transformations are gone as standard as it could get on that battle, but this they somehow managed to capture the magic and importance of this transformation with the music, the speed blitz, the stare down, as it made clear my reaction, I missed the Dragon Ball hype growing up, but I suspect this is how it first felt when Goku first unlocked the transformation. The only thing that would have been even more metal is if they kept the storyboard scene of Super Saiyan Bardock and Omni-Man headbutting each other almost to death in front of a fucking star. Like, I feel my pants getting wet just by saying that, man. Not to mention the music which in this epic crescendo as Nolan grabs the energy ball, channeling some Orc vs Broly, and shouts before the one last clash, to which Bardock doesn't survive. You said Saiyan. In his last words, he tells Nolan to remember the word Saiyan, as Nolan looks down in self-disdain, realizing he tore another family apart by killing a fellow father. With this reaction, further solidifying his newfound shame with the violence and murder that were once so ingrained into his very being. Also, while I appreciate the detail of Nolan targeting the arm he had already damaged earlier, I'm still flip-flopping on whether the go in this fight looks gnarly or more so like messy tomato sauce. I kinda change my mind on that every time we, we watch the fight. Regarding Bardock's last words, however, I assumed they were meant to be a mix between I hope you can live without uncertainty, remember it, and I hope you can remember the one man who beat you. Except, you know, it very much wasn't quite the case here. More so, I hope you remember the one man who almost beat you, and with that said, let's finally get into why that did not happen. So, as you may or may have not heard, there was a big controversy regarding the scaling used for these two fellas. Now, on my end, I normally don't pay too much attention about the debate itself in preparation for a new death battle, but since there was a huge death battle I had us before this, I kinda consumed everything in preparation for this matchup. And all the signs, interpretations and calculations I read, pointed to us this one following notion. Nolan takes speed and experience, Bardock, especially in the composite version they confirmed to use before the episode aired, takes everything else, including the W. I heard it so much that in my mind it kinda became a given that this is what Dead Bear was gonna do, because like, come on, the numbers are that. 
Then the episode dropped with the numbers pretty much not being that, and I swear, I never seen so many people unanimously agree about a death battle being won. I have seen people say that, oh, they didn't give X form to X character, debate about the realistic outcome for a battle where both fighters can control reality, or get upset when interpretation centered fight got interpreted, but this is different. So allow me to give you a Diet Coke version of the problems I've seen people bring up and why this outcome doesn't work. Let's start with strength, strength slash durability. In Nolan's previous episode, they capped them off at Monte Continental to Moon level, which was obviously more than enough to stomp Homelander. But going by the cogs in this episode, Nolan is now suddenly a large star level. I don't think much power scaling expertise is required to find out a wee bit high bar raising. The words sun disk quickly became the new thanks for the tip as far as controversial wing coin that battle memes go. As them scaling Nolan to that is a huge factor to his victory against the Saiyan warrior. Let's get into why that doesn't work. There is nothing in Invincible that supports the idea of Viltrumites being able to outright tank the large star level laser they scale Nolan to, especially since the heat of a star has shown to be outright lethal for Viltrumites. The ship quote, being able to tank the power of its own laser is meaningless, given how lasers, aka light, lack physical mass, and thus the same recoil as a fire armor would. Also, more simply, you are not bulletproof just because you can fire a gun. Tadeo saying this list of weapons that can harm Viltrumites will be very variable to us does not mean the coalition of planets lacks Viltrumite killing weapons, just that they were looking for more. Like, it will make very little sense to go into a fight relying entirely on one thing. Like, what do you do when that thing fails? Die? You have nothing. Why do you think Batman prepares for every single possibility? Jokes aside, the information is useful not because it will be all they have, but because the more the merrier. Secondly, just because the space gun ain't a viable option against Viltrumites, that does not mean it's because they can tank it. We are talking about human-sized targets that can move million times faster than light aka faster than lasers, that will make them supremely difficult to hit. It's kinda like why humanity would be fucked if Homelander tried to take over, because all of our weaponry that isn't fuck everything in that general direction is built for large and slow targets, the exact opposite of a flying Homelander. There is nothing stopping a Viltrumite from blitzing the ship and everyone on board because they can even think of pressing the button. In Freezer vs Megatron, they calculated Freezer's destruction of planet Vegeta resulting in 5.35 septillion tons, which was performed effortlessly by first form Freezer, whom Bardock scales to in Super Saiyan 4. In comparison, the Sunday scale in the gate to Nolan is just 3 septillion tons, meaning that even by their own logic, Super Saiyan Bardock would still be stronger and more durable. Secondly, we have the famous feat of Nolan destroying Viltrum. After his core was destabilized by the Infinity Ray, needing the help of fellow Viltrumites Mark and Tadeus, and them needing to attack at a precise angle, speed and timing, or they might die on impact. A notion supported by both elder Viltrumites. That battle kinda annoyed everything I said after I said after. Them saying, quote, note that the numbers listed do not include division between participants as equal effort is uncertain, still doesn't justify giving 1% of the merit to Nolan. In Dio vs Alucard, they talk about not giving Alucard the Schrodinger powers in order to not break the character narrative, something I totally respect them for to this very day. But if Nolan was as strong as he described him to be due to the Sun Disk, then he would simply would not need the help of other two Viltrumites to destroy Viltrum, as he could have done it at any time, by himself, with very little difficulty. So this goes against the very narrative of Invincible period. Again in Freezer vs Megatron, they established that Vegeta has 10 times the Earth's gravity, and in this they say Viltrum is only 1.55 times. This means they would take much more effort to destroy Vegeta than it would to Viltrum. It actually gets even worse because having that little of a because having that little of a density difference to Earth while being 14 times bigger would make it ridiculously lightweight for a planet, even less dense than Earth itself. And Nolan still needed help alongside a weakened core to destroy it.
and I could honestly go on and on, but you get it. That battle, by all accounts, got the scaling section of this matchup almost completely wrong. And while again I normally don't care about this stuff, I do see each dead battle as a story being told, and my standards for, for storytelling points towards creating a foundation that stands on its own and doesn't contradict itself, which this episode unfortunately does scaling wise based on both factual numbers and the pre what they previously said for Omni-Man. Now, do I think there's some Dragon Ball bias going on? I'm a bit weird with you, Chief. If I were the showrunner for this show, I would not be doing this much Dragon Ball stuff if I hated the show, nor would I dedicate a whole season finale to a same series fight with essentially the same character twice, or do the same matchup twice, if I hated Dragon Ball. In the days after the battle dropped, however, I did think about a much, much worse, worse case scenario. The idea that they purposefully gave this fight the wrong outcome to spark debate and gather views, especially in light of, risk of the Rooster Teeth situation. The idea was, of course, short-lived, as I realized that this episode was made much early compared to the Rooster Teeth cancellation, and it would simply be antithetical to how they do the show. I mean, I'm pretty sure they will make every episode controversial if views was all they care about. No, what I think happened is something... No, what I think happened is actually much simpler. They had various ideas, went with one that seemed correct at first, and that by the time they were almost done with this episode, it was too late to rectify it. So might as well stand by, the, stand by their own guns. And they certainly weren't gonna scrap an episode for a whole episode for this alone. This is what I like to call an artistic answer, let's say, Mixing with some business side of things, since you know, deadlines are working with multiple people and everything. Which brings me to the, mo the most important point, if you're still watching and if you really want to take something away from this video, take this. Do not adhere to the, we paid the Kickstarter for this mentality. People paid to get the show back on track because they love it and want to see the team keep on bringing banger after banger like they did last season. Like sure, this episode outcome is wrong and it's gonna be longer now as it is 10, 10 years later. But really, what then? Is that, is that really all that matter for a Dead Battle episode? Like, sure, scaling its objective doesn't work when you actually get something wrong. When you actually get something wrong. But think back on everything I said about the character analysis and the breakdowns, the edits, the animation, the voice acting, the callbacks, the sound effects, the interaction, the thematic stuff, thematical stuff that drive people obsessed with obsessed with finding links between things like me insane, the visuals, the music, the countless people that are going to do by countless to countless franchises thanks to this show. Like, sure, it's a shame that most of the things in this episode I praise in this episode will got overshadowed by the poor scaling and outcome. And obviously I would rather not have the Dead Battle team drown in controversy and mass harassment for every new video, mostly because that would make a very mentally draining experience for all parties involved. But if the options are either to never have that battle again, or occasionally get an episode that's the equivalent of a perfectly done cram caramel with a single end winning an otherwise beautiful thing, I will always pick the latter. So yeah, all that yapping to say that to me, Omni Bardock sits on a very comfortable 8.5 out of 10. But please, next time Invincible is on a show, no more Sandisk, please. <laughs> Doing lots of water out of the same, because good god knows this video is probably long. Oko Krypton, hoping I made your day slightly better.